1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to welcome you to the round pen. Hope that you brought your Bibles tonight. If you've been with us as we study through 1 Corinthians, uh, you know for uh, about three, three and a half chapters, we have been being taught by Paul uh, about this subject of Christian freedom or the freedom that we have in Christ as Christians. Um, he really opened this subject up in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, and uh, he kind of moved into a different area. And then uh, chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, it really broadened out uh, and so tonight, as we get to the end of chapter 10, uh, Paul is going to wind down his thoughts on this subject of Christian freedom. Now, we don't know really the specifics of how the subject of Christian freedom uh, got to such a broad sense. We do know according to verse 1 in chapter 7, that a letter was sent to Paul from the Corinthian church and asked him some questions. We don't know what the specifics was. We do know uh, that they were curious, as, as we see in chapter 8, about eating foods that had been sacrificed to idols. Now, we don't have a problem with that today. I mean, we'll just... We'll eat anything. And can I just say to you, it's okay to eat anything. Anything that God has created here that you can get past your lips and teeth and gums and God bless you. Uh, but they had a problem with foods that were sacrificed to idols. Some of them did. Now, obviously, Corinth was a stronghold for paganism. Uh, in this Greek culture, some of the less spiritually mature Christians had a problem with eating food that would be sacrificed to idols. Now, perhaps you remember that we said that a lot of these foods, because it was so much of it going on, the pagan priests would be paid with a portion of the foods that were sacrificed to these idols. And they were just acquiring so much of this meat that they would sell it to the markets. Now, the mature Christians had no problem uh, going down to the meat market and getting a, a good old slab of beef that had been uh, sacrificed to some pagan god that doesn't even exist. They didn't have a problem with that. Their spiritual maturity and their freedom allowed them just to go and partake. Hey, it's on sale. It's been sacrificed to Zeus, 10 pounds for a dollar. Get you some. Uh, they partook of that in their freedom. And there's no problem with that. But some of the less spiritually mature Christians had a problem with that. And that's how all this come about, this subject uh, that Paul expands on about our Christian freedoms. Now, he's going to wind this thought down tonight, and we're going to move on to another subject as we get into uh, chapter 11. Look at verse 31 of chapter 10, because... This verse really serves as a guide for us in every area of the Christian experience. Verse 31 does. And we're going to go back up and start at verse 23, but I want us to look at verse 31 because it sets the pace, it sets the tone, it's a guide for every portion, every area of our Christian experience. Look what it says, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or what? Ever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So everything that we do in the Christian walk that we are in uh, as a believer, we are to do for God's glory. Now, if we're going to do everything for God's glory, what does that tell us about who's first place in our life? It's God, right? It's not us. It's not our freedom, but it's the Lord. We're doing it for his glory. And I love the way Paul puts that. He starts off with the subject his hand, talking about food or a drink. And then he, he just 
he just caps the whole thing off by saying, or whatever you do. Doesn't matter if it has anything to do with food. Doesn't matter if it has anything to do with drink. Whatever we do in our Christian walk, we are to do it for the glory of God. Isn't that what he says? That's exactly what he says. Now back up at verse 3, 23. And this is where we're going to start tonight. Uh, continuing this thought about the freedom that we have in Christ. Paul says something that he's already said. Uh, in verse 23, he says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Now, Paul has already said that exact same statement back in chapter 6. I mean, word for word, he has said that. It's the second time. Uh, matter of fact, chapter 6, verse 12, he said that. He repeats it here again in chapter 10, verse 23. Now, this statement is concerning freedom in Christ. And that's a very broad statement, is it not? What does it mean when he says everything? <laughs> because if you, if, you, if you read that one verse, man, uh, you just take that verse and you pluck it out of context and you read it. And Paul says, hey, guys, everything is permissible. What does that say to you? There's no limits, right? As Christians, we, we just, <laughs> there's no fences, there's no boundaries. Anything we feel like doing, we can do. It's permissible. But obviously, there's more to it than that. What does it mean when he says everything? It's important that we understand what he's talking about. And what he's talking about is the subject at hand, Christian freedom. So, we got to understand what he's talking about. The word everything that he's referring to is everything that is not clearly marked out in Scripture as sin or morally wrong. Everything besides that we're free to participate in. If Scripture does not de declare it as sinful or marked out as morally wrong for the believer... We have the freedom to participate in that. Now, there's some gray areas that uh, we may have some struggles with. Uh, and there's some gray areas that some more uh, people that may be not as mature in their faith or mature in the word as you are would have a struggle with. And that's where the rub comes in, how we relate to them, how we use our Christian freedom, and how we don't abuse our Christian freedom. And there's a lot to learn here because what it's going to be teaching us tonight is, look, in our walk with Christ, I have to consider my other brothers and sisters in Christ. Human nature, we don't have to do anything to act this way. It's, it's just innate with us. It's ingrained in us. Everybody likes to be first, don't they? I mean, even if you're one of those guys who will sit back and wait for everybody, truth of the matter is, you just as soon to be first. Everybody loves a winner, right? Huh? Yeah. I mean, that's human nature. It's human nature not to consider others, right? How many of y'all got animals, by the way? Animals aren't considerate of each other, are they? Especially when it's chow time. That's when the claws come out. That's when the horns get to swinging. That's when it gets real. We're like that to an extent, but that's not how Christians are to be. That's not what God expects out of his people. Now, verse 23 says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. All he's simply saying here is we have the freedom to do some things. As long as it's not marked out clearly in Scripture as sin or is given to us as morally repute, we're free to do that, but in our freedom, our actions sometimes, as he says, is not constructive and it's not beneficial. If we're causing another brother or sister to stumble or struggle, what we're doing in our freedom is not beneficial and it's not constructive. That's his point here. Uh, what Paul is calling believers to, to do here. And let me put it to you this way. It's edification, which means to build up, 
over gratification. Maybe that'll stick with you. In this verse uh, that he's calling us to, edification over gratification. What do you... What do you know about gratification? We all like to be gratified, right? What rhymes with gratified? You said it, Kim. Say it loud. Satisfied. I love it when I have to drag it out of y'all, even though you know you know it. Everybody likes to be satisfied, right? You know, whether it's eating, whether it's drinking, whether it's whatever. Humans like satisfaction. This verse is calling us uh, to put edification, building up others. And that's what it means to be edified, to build up over satisfaction or gratification. That's what he's calling us to do here. Uh, Look at verse 24. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. How many, how many would take a test with me and say, man, I'm practicing that every day. I, I, I'm, I'm practicing that, man, that's not a problem. Uh, verse 24 is me. No one should seek his own good, but the good of others. Hands up's got that mastered. Nobody? How many? Uh, surely now we can do pretty good. How many is doing fairly good? We're just going to skip pretty good and go to fairly good. There you go. Here's a winner, winner, chicken dinner. There's a winner, winner. Charles, you went up, but man, you come down quick. Did you get to thinking about it on the way up and it fell right back down? This is what the Lord calls us to do, right? Not seek our own good, but seek the good of others. Man, that's a big statement. Now, you think about that. Verse 24, let's read it together. Nobody. He's talking to the Corinthian church. He's talking to Three Trees Cowboy Church. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. We're looking out for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are putting our brothers and sisters in Christ ahead of ourselves. How many of y'all been Southern Baptist most of your life? And I'm just using Southern Baptist because I know a little bit about them. Raise your hand. How many of y'all been in them good old Southern Baptist business meetings? They get rowdy. I mean, they just plumb forget they're Christians. Just... When they start doing this in the business meetings, swell up. I've seen that happen before. And it ain't just in Southern Baptist churches. You you name a church, it's happened there. What happens when we swell up in them old business meetings and we're at each other's throats? And by the way, that's why we don't have business meetings here. Are y'all all right? You will never be at a business meeting at this cowboy church. If you, if if you go to a business meeting at this cowboy church, uh, you're probably going to be there by yourself because we don't have them. What happens when those things get sideways and people start showing their fangs and they slamming them Bibles shut and they trying to get their own way and the fellow on this side of the building's hollering at the fellow on this side and uh, poor little old preacher, he's just kind of sh- just trying to hide behind the pulpit. What's happening there? Well, verse 24 ain't happening, is it? No, it ain't. By the way, that's an extreme example that I gave you. It can be a lot more quieter than that, a lot more civil than that. It can be simply uh, getting the last biscuit at the fellowship, right? I mean, look, I, I, I go to Iron Man breakfast the other morning. I, uh, this morning, I was here early. You know why? Because yesterday I was late. Man, I didn't even get a smell. Chris is laughing because he's feeling guilty right now. Snooze, you lose, right? It's a bad example. They didn't even know if I was coming or not. Anyway, so that is others over self, verse 24. Putting others over ourselves. By the way, that's a, it shouldn't be, but it is. That is a revolutionary verse for Christianity. And you know, we're having fun, but can I in all seriousness tell you that breaks the heart of Jesus when his kids, 
You know, you can see, you watch your kids and they fight and fuss, and you're probably like, oh, they'll get over it. Jesus ain't that away. Breaks his heart when we don't consider our brothers and sisters before we do ourselves. It's not just an idea. It's not just a good idea. It's the intention God has for his people. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. This ain't the only place Paul had to bring us up to the Philippian church. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. And that's a mouthful, isn't it? I mean, how many of us live that way? You know, our hands should be going up right now. We all live that way. We all consider our brothers and sisters in Christ above ourselves. I'm looking out for my brothers and sisters before I am myself. That's real Christianity, guys. Churches should never be at each other. We should be helping each other and looking out for each other spiritually, physically, and all different ways. That's what the Lord expects out of us. That's what this Christian freedom is about. We abuse our freedoms in Christ when we demand to have our ways, when we demand our rights in Christ, our freedom to participate in things. Now, in verse 24 and 25, Paul's going to kind of add some some balance to what's going on. Uh, and he's going to be he's going to be putting liberty freedom that we're talking about above legalism look at verses 24 and 25 i'm sorry 25 and 26 eating anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience eat anything in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. Now, verse 26 is the reason why we can do that. In verse 26, he's quoting Psalms 24.1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's why I said at the beginning, we don't have a problem with eating stuff, no matter where it came from, and we shouldn't. If it tastes good to us, if it won't kill us, if it's not poison, have at it. It come from the Lord's earth. The Lord created it. But verse 25, the reason I said Paul adds balance to this, when we're considering others, when we're dealing with other Christians who may be more spiritually immature, and that was the case here in Corinth, because some of them had a problem with Christians eating meat sacrificed to idols. When the truth of the matter is, There was nothing wrong at all with Christians eating that meat sacrificed to those idols. It it didn't do one thing to that meat. It It didn't mean that you were participating in paganism. It just meant that you happened to have a piece of meat that once upon a time was sacrificed to something that doesn't even exist. But the immature Christians... That was causing them to stumble. That was causing them to have a a real problem. Now, here in verse 25, Paul says, eat anything sold in the meat markets without raising questions of conscience. Paul has already stated to us that the welfare of others should be greater in concern for us than our gratification. But... Listen to this, because here's the balance. Others' standards should not rule over everything we do. And I'm going to keep it in the context that Paul's teaching it. Meats sacrifice to idols. Okay, I'm a mature Christian. I understand there's nothing wrong with that meat. It doesn't dishonor the Lord. It's not defiled simply because it has been sacrificed to an idol. It's a piece of meat. It comes from the Lord's earth. God put it here for me to eat. I'm going down to the meat market to go shopping for dinner. 
I see some regular meat. I see some meat that's on sale. I'm adding this to it just to make the story great. I see some meat that's on sale because the local pagan priest has brought it to sale. I'm going to buy me some meat that's on sale to save my family money. How, y how many of y'all buy stuff on sale? Cindy couldn't even wait for me to get finished. <laughs> You're a shopper, ain't you, sister? Sure. Should I, in the back of my mind, be thinking, oh, my goodness, I hope I don't offend anyone? That's what Paul's saying. He says, go eat the meat. Don't worry about it. Don't have it on your conscience. We live our lives for ourselves in the freedom that we have in Christ. That's the balance. I should consider my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm not going to let their standards rule over my life. Are y'all all right? I'm, I'm not going to call up my immature uh, classmate uh, that's in the Sunday school class with me and say, now look, this meat's on sale and I'm fixing to buy it. Are you going to be offended? That's not what he's calling us to do. But what if it does offend them? Well, he's fixing to give us an example of that. Paul uses all this to teach us even though we don't struggle with it anymore. Look at verse 27 through 30. Paul gives the example here of, of eating with an unbeliever. Let's read the scripture. Verse 27. If someone, if some unbeliever, that'd be a pagan, invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. The other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God Four. Now, that can be real tricky if you don't understand what's going on. So here you have a believer, a mature believer, and he's got a pagan buddy, an unbeliever. And he says, hey, man, come over. We're having some good old pork chops, which it wouldn't be pork chops because they wouldn't be eating pork chops. But all right, let's change it to some uh, good old roast beef. And Paul says, go if you want to go. Don't be hindered by the fact that he's an unbeliever. Go if you want to go. And when you get there and the roast beef is set down at the table, don't ask where it come from. Don't ask if it had been sacrificed to idols. Just stick your plate out and say, fill me up, man. I love roast beef. But then possibly there's someone else there who is a believer. And they know that this unbeliever bought this roast beef on sale because why? It was on the been sacrificed to idol shelf down at the grocery store. Brought it home, fixed it. He's immature in his walk with Christ. He don't understand that even though this food possibly, and all that it has been sacrificed to idols, he's offended. And he's going to be really offended if you, a fellow believer, partakes. So what are we supposed to do? Well, Paul says clearly, do not eat the meat. Why? Because it's going to cause your brother to stumble. Even though you know as a believer, ain't nothing wrong with it. I mean, sit there and look at it and think, man, if this dude wasn't here, I'd eat his part. But to keep the immature brother from stumbling, we don't exercise our freedom. What do we do? We consider our brother, and we withdraw or we withhold our freedoms. I'm free in Christ to eat that meat even though it's been sacrificed to a, a pagan god because there ain't no such thing as a pagan god. There ain't nothing wrong with that meat, man. It was on sale. But the younger 
brother in Christ or the younger sister or whoever it is, maybe a younger couple. It's going to cause them to stumble if you get some of it. So Paul says, don't eat it. Consider your brother in Christ. Now, you are all looking at me like, this thing got nothing to do with us. Yes, it does. It's got everything to do with us. Even though you may not struggle with pagan meat, there's other areas where we're free to participate in. And some people say no. Now, I'm not going to give you a list like you want me to. You got to figure this out in your life. Because you're sitting there thinking, okay, preacher, tell us what we can do, what we can't do. Not going to do that. Doesn't mention that. If they're unbelievers, they're not going to have a problem with it. Are they? Ma'am? Other things, yeah. What would you do, Kim? I would say no, too. Sure would. Right. I think so, but obviously in the context of what Paul's teaching here, it's to the church, and he's referring to those believers who are immature in their faith and and not have haven't grown up to understand that the lord has created everything and everything is clean to eat but yeah it could i'm with you on that that's why i said you got to look at what you're doing look at what you're participating in if god says no don't even think about it it's it's not doable it's not permissible But then there's those those gray, debatable areas that all Christians debate over. Should we or shouldn't we? Well, if it's going to cause another Christian to stumble, no, you shouldn't. I would agree with you if it's going to cause an unbeliever who may be, you know, God may be dealing with them, then absolutely not. Don't let your freedom and your gratification override causing someone else to stumble. At any cost. Does that make sense? That's what I would say. Now, the latter part of those verses there, there's some questions asked. Verse 29. The question is asked, uh, latter part of verse 29, why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? Now, If you don't keep everything lined up and in context and understand what Paul has already taught us about considering others, you'll look at that question through the wrong lens. So the question is, why should my freedom in Christ be judged by another man's conscience? And here's the answer to that. We shouldn't give them a cause to judge us by not participating and causing them to stumble. So the question is kind of directed at, look, I'm free in Christ to indulge in this. Just because he's immature in his faith, how can he judge me? Well, remember, we're to consider our other brothers and sisters in Christ before ourselves. So therefore, we don't give them an opportunity to judge us. We don't participate if it's going to cause them to stumble. Well, what about when they leave? Have at it. You're free to do so in Christ. Now, again, you've got to figure out. <laughs> you got to figure out what's what in this. Amen? Uh, there's another question I ask. Verse 30. Uh, if I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of someone or something I thank God for? Again, if you don't keep it in context, if you don't understand what the Lord's calling us to do, you'll look at that question through the wrong lens. Let me read the question again. If I take part in the meal, the meal at hand with the unbeliever, with thankfulness, 
Why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? Well, here's the answer to that. How can you actually be thankful to the Lord for something that you know is going to cause your brother or sister to stumble? You really can't be thankful for it. Again, it's, it's relaxing our freedoms. It's choosing not to for the sake of others. And that's what the Lord's calling us to do here. We can't actually be thankful if it's going to cause our brothers and sisters to stumble because of what we're doing. Don't do it. They're more valuable than your freedom at the moment, right? Yeah. It's like uh, when your wife says, hey, swing by the pizza place and bring a pizza home for dinner. And you're trying to drive home with that hot pizza right there. 20 miles and you and the pizza. All you got to do is, this is what I do. You know, they, there's a little old lip sticking out on the front of that box. That's for your thumb. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's done. But then when you get home, what happens? You just couldn't wait, could you? <laughs> you just had to get a pizza. How many guilty men are in here? Every one of you. You women don't do that, though, do you? Y'all are like, yeah, I can wait. I got willpower. Relax our freedoms for the sake of others. That's what he's calling us to do. All right, let's finish and get out of here. Are y'all all right? Okay. Look at verses 31 and 32. This is our purpose as believers. This is how we operate as believers. Verse 31. We've already read it. This is our guidelines. This is our purpose. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So we really could, honestly, guys, let's pull the wagon over right here. Couldn't we really sum all this up by saying, asking ourselves in whatever particular situation we're in, is what I'm fixing to do is how I'm acting. Is this going to glorify God? That's it. I can't tell you how many conversations I have had with people about alcohol. And they give me every excuse why they should. And, and my response is, well, look, Hoss, just answer them. Does it glorify the Lord? Well, don't do it. That sums it up. And not just alcohol, a thousand different things. Does it glorify the Lord? Well, it, it's neutral. It don't, it don't. Well, then do it. But you're, why are you even asking me? Just do it, man. If you're free to do it, do it. You want the preacher to give you permission to drink? I'm not, who am I? I'm another sinner. Does it glorify the Lord? You feel good about doing it? Go do it. But you're asking me for a reason. There's a reason you're asking me. You've never called me about a hamburger. Right? That head full of snuff you've got right now, you ain't said a word about to me. I mean, why are you asking me about a beer? There's something to that. <laughs> All right, moving on. Do it for the glory of God. Verse 32, do not cause anyone to stumble. Whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, there's your lost folks. There you go. Don't cause folks to stumble. If it's going to cause folks to stumble, don't do it. Parents, your kids, you can trip them up. That do as I say, not as I do deal, don't work. That's of the devil. That I'm grown because I'm grown, <laughs> they're going to grow up. You don't stay kids all your life, for the most part. Doesn't work. You cause them to stumble, guys. You better be careful. You know how many times I've had parents sit across my desk because their kid's in jail or 
their kids got in a fight and beat the stuffings out of someone, or their kids got caught with dope, or their kids got this filthy mouth, or their kids is always fussing and out of control. And this is every time. They weren't raised that way. You show? Are you show? <laughs> I wasn't in your house, but are you sure? Because the smartest people on the planet, how many school teachers we got in here? Can't fool a kid, can you? You really can't. Kids are slick. Can't fool kids. Built-in baloney detectors. God gives it to them. Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks or the church of God. Here's Paul. He's uh, our example. Christ was his example. Verses 33 all the way to verse 1 of chapter 11, and we're done. We're out of here. Verse 33, even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, here we go, so that they may be saved. People's always watching us at all times. Verse 1 of chapter 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Boy, you think about Jesus Christ when he came, who was on his mind at all times? What was the life of Christ all about? Saving us. Saving us. He put us so far ahead of himself. That night in the garden, if you really want to know what it was like for Jesus and how much he put us ahead of himself, go to the gospel where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and see what kind of night he had there. And that was my fault and your fault. That's how far Christ put us ahead of himself. Amen or not? 